Welcome to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. This is Alice Lee Hagen. My guest today is the tamer of the wild lion in Kahala, Steve Sombrero. He is the president and principal owner of NAI Cheney Brooks, the oldest and most recognized locally owned commercial real estate company in Hawaii. The company is consistently ranked in the top three firms in uh, commercial real estate companies. Welcome, Steve. Great to have you. Now, um, you have over 25 years of real estate experience and you have been consulting with many of the Fortune 500 companies and other Asia-based conglomerates. Um, you're also a partner of Hoku Brewing and of course one of our... Um, Aloha Beer Company. Oh, I'm sorry. Aloha <laughs> uh, Beer Company. Yes. And of course, um, one of our illustrious alumnus of our executive MBA program at the Shidler College of Business. Now, um, as I mentioned, you have been in uh, commercial real estate for almost 30 years. You've had a lot of successful transactions, but um, let's come straight to this very successful and well-known one with um, Mr. Genshiro Kawamoto. But yes. before we ask you to share the um, story, maybe I can ask the producer to uh, show the picture of the um, Kawamoto lion picture, and that would kind of explain why I titled this episode The, wild, uh, the Tamer of the Wild Lion. So, Steve, want to talk to us <laughs> about this picture here? <laughs> Right. This was taken. Uh, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me today. I'm, uh, it's, a, it's a pleasure to join you today and uh, talk a little bit about myself and uh, the work that I do. Um, that photo you just saw was taken uh, in front of the yard of uh, one of the homes that Mr. Kawamoto owned. And, uh, Can uh, we have the picture up sure. again, please? Sorry. This was basically a photo of myself sitting on one of the lion statues celebrating the uh, pending close and the end of uh, a very long journey for uh, Mr. Kaomoro as well as a long journey for the people at Kahala. So this was a victory um, uh, ride on the lion. And uh, I, I don't know if he's a wild lion, but he, it was certainly a wild ride for everybody in Kahala. So that's uh, pretty re representative of what I think, uh, how we felt at that time. Uh, it is, and I also have to thank you for sharing this picture with me because I believe that you said you have never shown this picture to No, um, this is a, a very uh, personal picture, and uh, I'm sure that uh, um, unless I explain to you what's going on, most people will look at it and think that maybe I've lost my mind. <laughs> <laughs> well, in context, we understand clearly what this represents, and I guess on behalf of Think Tech Hawaii, I want to thank you for that. You're now, um, we all know about the successful transaction, and it, it's one of the largest transactions here in Hawaii. But of course, in reading some of the stories in the media, um, I also realized that it took you a long time to um, finally uh, score this transaction. Um, I think we are interested in the process. So could you tell us that part? Right. Um, I'm the kind of person that I always ask the what if question mm -hmm. you know, in my business. And uh, that's probably what gets me into a lot of trouble. I've always asked the what if question. And I should stop right there, but then I go beyond that. And uh, back in 2009, I asked uh, Alexander Baldwin, I said, what if I could get you the entire portfolio that Kaomoto owns in uh, Hawaii. And well, of course, they immediately laughed and said, you could do that? And I said, well, I'll give it my best shot. Can you hold on there? Mm -hmm. Because the thought is, how, how did this idea come to you? Well, um, I was watching the news. I, was, I understood that in Kahala, uh, Mr. Kaomoto had not been your best neighbor. And, and many of the people there uh, hoped that um, he would stop buying the homes and uh, uh, um, basically turning the, uh, the community into a place of uh, statues and whatever it is that he was doing there. So I, I knew that there was a problem to be solved. And I knew that this couldn't continue. And that um, um, I also knew that uh, the, the, the neighborhood you know, in Kahala uh, was hoping something good would come out of it. And of course, AMB was, is, is, an, is a real estate investment company that is always looking for opportunities. And mm -hmm. here was um, out of the box thinking on what could be done. Mm -hmm. And so I came up with the idea, I said, you know, what if mm -hmm. I was able to bring the entire Kaomoro uh, estate and, and you can buy the entire portfolio? And I said, sure. So 
um, you know, at A and B, I, I, I've got to give them credit for this because they, um, uh, although they're a conservative and uh, organization, they are always open to uh, ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think over the years, because I've, I've had a long relationship with A and B. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know this, but I used to sell Kauai coffee beans for them prior to my real estate career. So. Uh, okay, so <laughs> your entrepreneurial right, side. Right. So we'll talk about that right. later. Um, but I. You know, before the interview, you were telling me that um, you were not the only one who was looking at the uh, Kawamoto properties. Yes. There were other um, real estate companies that mm. were interested. Absolutely. Well, you know, the if you just drive down um, uh, Kahala Avenue, you will see the uh, brokers with their signs, and so you have um, a long-time um, uh, residential firm, Pat Choi, has done extremely well. In fact, she represented Mr. Kalmono on um, many of his transactions. Mm -hmm. And so uh, there's also uh, Sachi, Sachi Braden, mm -hmm. uh, Coldwell Banker, and on. So, you know, I am in the commercial real estate space. I'm not in the residential space, mm -hmm. but I saw this as um, a, uh, a different opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't do individual homes, but I saw that this was an investment opportunity. So. Um, uh, I knew I know that uh, many of the residential brokers in the business uh, perhaps uh, had um, wished that they had pursued this opportunity like I did. But this is back in two, 2009 when um, things were going well for Mr. Kalmoto. And so, uh, as you said, I pursued uh, Mr. Kalmoto for four years precisely wow. until I was able to um, uh, deliver on the promise that I had made with my client, mm -hmm. Alexander Baldwin. Do you know if any other brokers have been as persistent as you have? I think many brokers are not as crazy as I am, maybe. <laughs> I don't know if that's the word, because trying to go after the entire portfolio is, mm. is really, um, uh, not that I think about it, it was probably um, not very realistic. Right? Uh, we, here was a man that was buying, not selling. And so why would anybody believe that he would want to sell the entire portfolio? Mm -hmm. So. Um, it was definitely an out-of-box thinking, mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and I made that a goal, and I pursued it. Um, tell us about, uh, well, okay, let me preface this by saying, when I was researching this interview, I saw the testimonial from a &B saying that um, you've been able to establish trust with Mr. Kawamoto, and that was no small feat. Yes. And it's a huge, uh, significant accomplishment. Um, tell us about your relationship with Mr. Kawamoto? Well, um, it took four years to develop that relationship. Mm -hmm. And uh, honestly, for the, for the first um, three and a half years, um, he would not even see me. And so I would go to his office in uh, Tokyo and Ginza and would deliver a proposal for him and he, he would not even see me in person. So I would have to get it delivered to him through his um, security guard. And the security guard would take it from me and say, "Go away now! No, you're not you're not wanted here." So um, I did this for three and a half years, and uh, believe me, this was during the dead of summer when it's extremely hot in Tokyo, or in the dead of winter when it's extremely cold. And for somebody from Hawaii to be standing outside his building in the rain, uh, in the cold, is not a you know it ta that takes persistence. And so I did this for three and a half years, and on the fourth year, I had my first break, but um, during the three and a half years, I was, I met many people that had claimed to know him in person, that mm -hmm. they know him personally, and that they had tried to get me in front of him, but none of them could. What kept you going? And um, were there times when you said, is this a crazy idea? What am I doing here standing in the cold? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, like anything else um, in, in the brokerage business, uh, you do feel a sense of rejection. And this is three and a half years of rejection, so it's not a very pleasant thing. But I knew that this was a very important project, not just for um, Alexander and Baldwin, but it was an important project for the people of Kahala. It was an important project for, actually for Hawaii, because as you know, Kahala is the, the uh, symbol of uh, um, uh, you know, high-end uh, residential uh, community. Mm -hmm. and. If we, if we cannot have a uh, respectable high-end community, then what does that say for the rest of the community? So I knew this was something I had to do for Kahala. And also, I, I knew in my mind that this was something that would also help Mr. Kawamon in the process. For him to sell 
you know, the 30 plus homes individual will take, will take time mm -hmm. and there'll be a lot of hit and misses and there'll be a lot of uh, negotiations, but a one shot deal where one buyer buys the entire portfolio, now that would be very attractive to him. So I knew that that, that would be the attraction to him. Wow. Um, now, the transactions at the end is just a transaction. Um, but the word trust is really important, especially in the Asian culture. And yes. I guess I was, uh, I'm interested in learning about your, your friendship with Mr. Kawamoto because um, I think I read in one of the stories that he considered you as one of his few friends. And you mentioned those uh, three and a half years when you were trying to get to meet him, that you've met a lot of people. So can you share with us um, how he feels about relationship and building trust, that, that aspect of the transaction? I think for Mr. Kamoto, mm -hmm. trust is really a, a big thing mm -hmm. uh, because over the years he had burnt a lot of bridges. You know, he mm -hmm. had um, made a lot of acquaintances in, in, in Hawaii, but you know, um, not all of them have, have gone positively. In fact, what resulted in bad relationship is what, what led to the, the behavior he was exhibiting in Kahala. So, Can you, what do you mean by right. the bad relationship? So obviously putting up a, a, a big lion or a big Buddha or a big pagoda or whatever it is or, or a half naked statue on, mm -hmm. in the middle of the driveway is not you know, a, a neighborly thing to do. But um, he was doing that and in fact I asked him, I said, Mr. Kamoro, I'm sure a lot of people in Hawaii would want to know why. What is it about these statues? What is, do you do? You like statues? And he said, "Yes, I, I appreciate. Uh, I consider it art, but it is my way to buy more property." So, there's a, um, a phrase in Japan. Um, it's called jiage. Jiage is not a really good word, but it's a, a, a real estate term where you try to um, make um, someone sell a property that that you know, uh, not forcefully, but you coerce them to sell the property by making it making it uh, um, undesirable so the statues he knew were, was making uh, things undesirable for his neighbors and when he put it up he would go and ask would you like to sell me your home and he was, he was hoping that they would say yes so if you remember um, some properties had more statues than the others that's because his neighbors wouldn't sell him so he would start concentrating and putting his army of statues so to speak to help him do the deal so once you heard the story, what, what, what was your response to him? Um, what I gathered is um, um, I understood that he, well, in fact, I asked him, what, what were you trying to accomplish in mm -hmm. Hawaii? And he said, I'm an investor like anyone else. I'm trying to uh, make money in, in Hawaii. And mm -hmm. so I, I buy low and I sell high. That's what I do. And so um, I utilize my skills to uh, coerce or persuade people to sell me their home. And then um, after I accumulate enough portfolio, I would sell at a higher price. That was his goal, so real simple. And rather than relying on market forces to uh, make uh, people sell it to him, he found a way to um, persuade people to sell it to him. And so uh, here, here's, a, here's the interesting part. Every time he put up a um, weird statue, mm -hmm. people would come and see him. And, I, mm -hmm. and the media would be all over him. Right. And so, he would get notoriety and he would get uh, attention. And so he started enjoying that. Ah. And so I think what happened in the end was that he thought that maybe putting up a statue and putting rocks into the pool and destroying the fence or whatever it is uh, was um, basically attracting attention and he was starting to, starting to enjoy it. And so uh, indirectly, our media was starting to, um, what do you call, uh, reward him for behavior that normally we should we wouldn't be uh, rewarding interesting perspective so, mm -hmm. we're coming up on a short break but when we come back I'm interested in hearing more about um, your proficiency in Japanese and your uh, your comfort level in that culture sure. and how it has um, contributed to the success of your business yes. my guess is Steve Sombrero, he is the president and owner of NI, NAI Cheney Brooks in Hawaii. We'll be right back. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I host a show called Healthcare in Hawaii here on ThinkTech. We get together once a week or sometimes uh, twice a month. Depends when we're busy. We get together less often, but we love to see you here to talk about the preeminent healthcare issues in our state. 
Our programs vary very widely. We talk about economics, we talk about health care, we talk about social issues on this program. Thanks for joining us. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My name is Alice Lee Hagen. With me today is Mr. Steve Sombrero. He is the president and principal owner of NAI Cheney Brooks in Hawaii. Before the break, we have been talking about the very well publicized Kawamoto transactions that occurred uh, late, uh, late last year. So Steve, you were talking about um, Mr. Kawamoto and uh, talking about him being an investor and how somehow there was a lot of misunderstanding perhaps between him and people here in Hawaii. Um, let's go back to your friendship with him. Right. Would you like to elaborate on that? Right. Um, whenever, whenever somebody helps you, you become your best, you know, you bec he becomes your best friend. Mm -hmm. So um, after we closed the transaction, I became his best friend because obviously, you know, um, his fear was that this was uh, going to lead to a bad result. Mm -hmm. he, he wasn't sure that we were going to um, close uh, successfully. Mm -hmm. and, and mind you, um, he, he, the government had already taken away his passport, so he couldn't come back to, to Hawaii to sign documents, and he couldn't go to the American Embassy to get forms uh, notarized without a passport. So it was a very challenging transaction. But and so despite all these um, uh, challenges, we were able to come through and we closed as we said we would. He got his money, the deed was transferred, and so that's when I became his best friend <laughs> in Hawaii. I did what I told him we were going to do. Okay. And uh, that's why uh, to this day when I do go to Japan, whenever, when, when there's time, I will call him and he would welcome me and uh, we would share a cup of tea and uh, he, he enjoys the uh, Japanese melon. <clears throat> which mm -hmm. is a very expensive melon, and we would share that and uh, talk story. And, and he still lo loves Hawaii. Mm -hmm. So he likes to learn what's going on in Hawaii, mm -hmm. and he'll mention names in Hawaii, and I, and I tell him what I, what I know about them. And, and so we just like to talk story. So you're really <clears throat> his connection to Hawaii then. Yes. Um, can he, uh, is he able to travel now? Um, he still does not have his passport, mm -hmm. so um, he's not able to travel, mm -hmm. uh, certainly not to the United States. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned that every time mm -hmm. you go to Japan, um, you will have a cup of tea with him, you will enjoy this expensive melon with him. Mm -hmm. um, that brings me to the question of your fluency in the Japanese language and your comfort in the culture. Um, how much do you think that attributes to your success? Perhaps not only for this particular mm -hmm. transaction, but with, with your business in general? Right, uh, I think um, not only do I speak the language, by, uh, but I speak the culture, which is really different. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, there are many uh, um, gaijin. Gaijin is a foreigner. Mm -hmm. um, I'm half gaijin, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm, I'm half uh, Okinawan, I'm half Filipino, so I don't know what that makes me, but <laughs> certainly not a Japanese person. But even with a name like Sombrero, yes. you, you, you look at my name and, and the last thing you would expect to hear is Japanese, but I right. do speak Japanese. Mm -hmm. and a lot of that has to do with the fact that my wife has taught me how to speak good Japanese. Oh, so okay. when I first met her, mm -hmm. I uh, spoke Okinawan dialect Japanese, and she would you know, be very confused what I was saying, but over the years she... Um, corrected me and today I sp probably speak better Japanese than she does because of the technical words that I picked up along the way. I, I know how to say things for the coffee industry, for the chicken farming business, for real estate, for banking okay. and you know of course my wife would not normally not use these words. So Now um, I've known a lot of people, um, people who want to learn a, you know, a different language 
but for you to pick up all these technical um, language, uh, the, the business side of the language, how did you do that? And what drove you? What was the driving force behind it besides your wife? Well, you know, in our, in my, uh, uh, I grew up in a home where uh, at least three languages were spoken simultaneously. So if you had joined dinner at the Sombrero household, you'd be hearing uh, English, Japanese, Okinawan, and then when my father got frustrated, he started yelling at, with, to us in Tagalog, with the Filipinos. So um, there are four languages actually spoken. So, but the thing is, our minds didn't feel like we're speaking a particular language, but we're just communicating. So it comes very naturally for us. So for me, when I uh, go to Japan and uh, walk Tokyo or wherever it is, mm -hmm. um, it just flows naturally, mm -hmm. and I can uh, uh, feel very comfortable and make the other person feel very comfortable. Mm -hmm. I have the intonation, I mm -hmm. have the delivery, mm -hmm. and those are things that you learn along the way. Yeah. Right, because you said you speak the culture, and um, it's too bad we can't show your interview in Japanese. But when I watched it, I said, "Wow, um, that's very different from your English self." Yes. Do you? Um, how did you adapt that? How did you gain that proficiency? Well, seriously, mm. when you have a lot of fights with your wife, <laughs> you learn to speak good Japanese. Okay. You, you, I mean, because, you know, it, it's one thing to to talk about, um, you know, uh, sushi or whatever, mm. but when you're trying to uh, reason with your wife so she doesn't kick you out of the living room, you learn to use words that are that come from the heart. And it's, it's the time when you start speaking from the heart that you start speaking perfect Japanese or perfect language. So this is the <laughs> last personal question I'll ask you. So you don't <laughs> argue in English then? No, well, when, uh, when I'm in serious trouble, mm -hmm. that's when I switch to English. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, coming back to your business, right. um, how do you think your comfort and proficiency in, in Japanese and all these other languages um, help? Well, um, I uh, uh, took over Cheney Brooks in 2006, mm. and uh, I, you know, Cheney Brooks is a very old company. It was established in 1958 by mm -hmm. Mr. Cheney and Mr. Brooks. Mm -hmm. It had been sold to a Japan company in uh, uh, 1984, mm -hmm. and when I had joined the firm in 2000, it was basically a company in, uh, facing a lot of challenges. And when I took it over in 2006, I looked at the company and uh, I looked at the competition and I asked myself, how am I going to keep this company alive? Mm -hmm. And so I, I knew that our competitors were very well established in their relationships with mainland companies, but none of them were establishing uh, relationships with uh, Asian companies. Mm -hmm. So uh, in 2006, I made it a goal to make Cheney Brooks the number one Hawaii commercial real estate company mm -hmm. that has um, will do more Japan Asia transactions than any other company and uh, made that a goal I even had a map of the Pacific and I put oh, wow. Hawaii in the middle and mm. I drew this crazy eight sideways mm. and I said this is the flow of transactions from the United States through Hawaii through Japan uh, Korea Taiwan Philippines and I drew that map and I kept showing it to my brokers my staff and they all understood what I was trying to do and lo and behold today uh, Cheney Brooks is doing more um, Asia, uh, Hawaii transactions than any other firm in Hawaii. Now, um, of course, you established this goal in 2006. You have accomplished a lot. Um, and I also read that um, uh, former Governor Ariyoshi's son also works for you. Yes. And I guess he is also helping you to expand the market. Yes. So, now that you have a successful foothold in Japan, um, what are your plans um, for the other markets? Well, um, you know, in Governor Ariyoshi, I, I'm just totally honored that he and his son feel that we're, um, it, basically, we're just honored that they've chosen to work with us because the governor has tremendous uh, respect everywhere he goes, not just Japan, but mm -hmm. anywhere in Asia, and of course, the United States. Mm -hmm. um, he's very well respected. And he has uh, relationships with very high-level uh, mm -hmm. individuals. So mm -hmm. um, we went on a trip, a trade mission, if you want to call it a trade mission, mm -hmm. uh, last year with the governor and uh, Ryozo Ariyoshi, his son. Mm -hmm. And we basically revisited all his friends. And uh, the message was very clear. Uh, the governor um, basically invited 
his friends in Japan to once again look at Hawaii again. Hawaii is a good investment. And he also mentioned that in the 1990s, uh, when the Japan bubble burst, mm -hmm. um, many Japan companies lost a lot of money and they left. And, and, and he basically s told them, the reason why many of the Japan companies didn't do well is because they didn't pick the right partners. And here is, is Mr. Sombrero. Mm -hmm. He has helped a lot of Japan companies do very well. And I, I, I urge you to consider working with him and uh, he'll take care of you. So that was the message, and I was just totally honored to be, for him to be saying that. And so we visited uh, uh, Takenaka Corporation, and who shows up? Chairman Takenaka shows up. We mm -hmm. go to Kyocera, mm -hmm. Mr. Inamori, Chairman Inamori shows up, and, and on and on. And we even had um, uh, um, a long conversation with Prime Minister Abe, and, wow. and, the, uh, and the governor knows mm -hmm. his father and his grandfather. So mm -hmm. I, I'm just uh, trying to figure out now how to um, take these relationships and not just um, make a business out of it, but also fulfill the promises that, that we're making along the way. So we are going to help companies, and our, our goal is to make companies successful. And I'm glad you brought up that point because um, I guess remember earlier on before our interview, you mentioned about your company culture. I mean, you can establish these goal, goals and you can have um, people to to the right introduction, but without a successful company and culture, um, things don't happen. So tell us about something about Cheney Brooks that not too many people know about. Okay, a good question. Um, well, not only the fact that we speak uh, multiple languages, because in our company we not just speak Japanese, but mm -hmm. we have people that speak Chinese, um, Korean, mm -hmm. Filipino, um, and uh, Pigeon, of course. We have a lot of Pigeon being spoken in, in the office. Oh, but okay. um, the, 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 the real, I, I, I truly believe that in any business, there are certain things you can do and you cannot do. And certain things, you, you even though you try, you can't make it happen, that requires faith. And so our company is a faith-based organization. And a lot of, um, many people don't know this, but mm -hmm. um, at Cheney Brooks, every Monday morning at 7 o'clock, we have a group of people that meet to do Bible studies in the office, and we pray for the week ahead. We pray for the clients, we pray for our customers, we pray for people that we haven't even have met yet, and we pray for our families, and we pray for our health, and we've been doing this um, for since 2008, since that crazy eight thing you know, that, that I drew. But um, I, I can say with all honesty that since we started this practice, our company has been doing extremely well. and. Um, and I truly believe that um, we are in a business where if you don't recalibrate yourself every week, um, it's very easy to go off on a tangent because we're dealing with millions of dollars of people's um, assets. We're dealing with hundreds of millions of dollars of properties. And if you don't keep your heart and mind aligned with what you're supposed to do, it's very easy to get in trouble. And I think that's probably one of the things that Mr. Kalmoto didn't have is someone that kept him straight. And uh, he went off on a tangent, and uh, uh, completely tangent, and the result was uh, that lion statue I was sitting on <laughs> that day. <laughs> have you talked to him about that? Yes, I have. Mm. Um, because uh, now he's sitting on a lot of cash. So I, I asked Mr. Kamoro, he's, um, I asked him, uh, what, what are you planning to do? You know, you can't take this with you. You know, he's, he's, uh, he's in his uh, early 80s now. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, in fact, he got, he spent a little bit of time in the hospital um, uh, late last year. And uh, so he realized that his health is not going to be great forever. And so I asked him, would you like to maybe um, use your monies to help people? Mm -hmm. And I gave him some ideas. And one of the things I suggested to him was to um, help to form uh, uh, churches, establish churches to help the people of Japan. And so um, he didn't get offended he you know he listened very attentively mm -hmm. and i think uh, he's actually considering it that's fascinating mm -hmm. steve um mm -hmm. i wish i could ask you more questions about that but um, we're coming to the second break and after that i want to ask you about your other side uh, other side of your business your entrepreneur other entrepreneurial ventures y you mean this yes <laughs> okay. the aloha beer okay. My guest is Steve Sombrero. He is the president and principal owner of NAI Cheney Brooks. We'll be right back. <laughs> Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at ThinkTech Hawaii. 
You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii Business Education. Aloha, welcome to Think Tech Hawaii. My name is Josh Green. I'm the host of of Cheney Brooks. And before the break, we have been talking about the successful company culture, which is a faith-based faith -based business. And that's why he has been able to uh, successfully accomplish the goal that he set in 2006 to expand his business into the Asia Pacific market. Um, Steve, now, um, Real estate aside, you have a lot of un other entrepreneurial ventures. And before the break, you were showing us that. The yes. Aloha beer. Yes. Um, and then you also alluded to the Kauai coffee yes. business. OK, maybe if you could tell us about the Aloha beer first. How sure. did you first come, come up with an idea like this, which is totally removed from real estate? Well, first of all, I think this is the best beer in the market today if I can say so right now. So, but uh, um, this was uh, a, actually a project that I uh, wrote mm -hmm. in, uh, during my executive MBA program. Mm -hmm. um, I was in the program in 1992. Mm -hmm. I was uh, MBA number eight. And one of the classes had us write um, business plans for uh, ideas that are not here in Hawaii yet. And so I had just moved to Hawaii um, five years earlier really don't, didn't know too much about Hawaii, and I had actually no idea. So I went to the Mai Tai Bar and uh, sat there at World Hawaiian uh, Hotel Mai Tai Bar, and I sat there and observed, and I was watching the tourists one by one come in. The waiter would say, aloha, and then the customer would say, biru, and then they would get a Budweiser. And it kept happening, aloha, biru, Budweiser. So I said, wow, Hawaii needs a beer. <laughs> We can't be serving Budweiser every time somebody asks for beer. And, uh, and of course, there was Aloha beer. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's it. I'm <laughs> going to write about Aloha beer. It was real simple. Uh -huh. And I wrote the paper. And uh, I actually did a case study on Primo, why Primo had not succeeded and why Primo had left the island and so forth. So I'm sorry, what is Primo? Primo beer. Oh, okay. It was uh, the number one beer, local beer. Uh, this is prior to your time. Okay. This is um, our, our fathers and grand. Yeah, father's oh, age, right? So, right. actually, probably, I'm much older than you, so it's probably my age. I don't uh, know. We'll talk about that okay. after. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote the paper, mm -hmm. and I got an A, mm -hmm. and uh, it made a lot of sense. It talked about why, uh, how Hawaii needed a beer, and mm -hmm. the name was just fantastic. Mm -hmm. So, um, the professor said, "You know what? You got to do this one day. Why? Why doesn't Hawaii have an Aloha beer? It's just such a natural name, and so." I said, I will do it. And so at that time, this was 1993, 94, mm -hmm. I checked and the um, name Aloha Beer had not been registered yet. So I grabbed it and I held on to it and I told myself, I'll do it one day. Mm -hmm. and, and I did. And here it is. This is a, an executive MBA, University of Hawaii uh, <laughs> paper that has turned into uh, an actual product. This is such a great story. <laughs> so in your cohort, do you know who else have actually um, executed what they have planned to do? You know, I don't really know. Mm. Um, uh, I'm sure there are many people that have uh, written plans and executed, mm -hmm. but nothing's as fun as beer. Don't, mm -hmm. you, don't you agree? Yes, this has actually made this a very relaxing interview for yes. me. So. Well, you got to catch up with my <laughs> beer. <laughs> now, OK, Aloha beer aside, um, you said something about chicken. Yes. Uh, talk about the Kauai coffee business. First. All right, um, I'll get to the chicken later. But okay. uh, Kauai coffee, mm -hmm. um, I had just moved to, to uh, Hawaii, and, and you need to know that I moved to Hawaii because my daughter uh, had some medical issues, and she was only two years old. And so um, my wife and my daughter had spent uh, more than six months in Japan trying to figure it out, and they couldn't figure it out. So um, we were living in Guam at that time, mm -hmm. and so um, we decided to move out of Guam. Now, I had a lot of businesses going. You think I'm busy right now. Back. Back in the days, I, I was involved in chicken farming. I was involved in real estate. I was involved in uh, uh, retail stores, um, parking concession for the Guam International Airport. 
I had a, a tour company that was doing uh, cockfighting and bringing wow. tourists to a cockfight show. And uh -huh. Anyway, so, um, uh, but then uh, my, my daughter got sick, so, mm -hmm. um, you know, my, my wife and I said, you know what, our daughter is more important. Mm -hmm. our, our children are more important. Mm -hmm. So we packed up and we got on a plane and uh, moved to Hawaii and, uh, and proceeded to, you know, take care of our daughter. And of course, you know, Hawaii has great medical services. And Thank so, you for saying that. Yes, great medical services. And uh, she was, uh, uh, she made it. And so my wife and I decided we we're gonna stay here. And I, but during the time I was in, in uh, Hawaii, I decided to pursue my, life, one of my lifelong dreams was to get my uh, graduate uh, education. Mm -hmm. So I wanted my MBA. And so got my MBA and uh, again, this is what happened. So along the way, as I said, um, Prior to doing real estate, I had actually been hired by um, uh, one of my classmates mm. who was in the M MBA program, mm -hmm. and uh, he actually worked for HCNS Sugar for uh, Alexander oh, Baldwin okay. and mm -hmm. also did Kauai Coffee, and he mm -hmm. said, Steve, we need your help. We're mm -hmm. trying to expand our market into Asia. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to know a lot about Asia, and we want to hire you. And I said, sure. And so um, I worked for AMB as their bean seller, <laughs> selling beans, coffee oh. beans. And so we um, went to Japan, went to Taiwan, Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, Korea, and so forth. And Japan was one of our bigger, bigger markets. Mm -hmm. And there was a time when uh, Tiger Woods mm. uh, actually promoted Kauai Coffee in an advertising uh, that was done by Asahi Beer. When was that? Uh, this is, um, when was that, 1997, I think. Oh, really? Yeah, so wow. Asahi Beer, uh -huh. um, uh, has a line of coffee mm -hmm. uh, called Wanda Coffee. It's a canned coffee. Mm -hmm. And so they actually had hired Tiger Woods to go on, on TV to promote a can of Kauai coffee and say how great it was. So we brought that video back and mm -hmm. showed it to the board of A and B and uh, we got a lot of uh, um, excitement. Oh, so I'm speak. sure. Yes. Wow. Right. So that was my, that's my coffee. So anyway, trying to sell coffee uh -huh. and trying to sell coffee, you know, the world knows Kona coffee. Yes but nobody knew about Kauai coffee. Mm -hmm. So we had to prove to people that there was such a thing as Kauai coffee. But you're not doing that anymore. No, I'm too busy. Um, well, you know, now I've got my beer. <laughs> so what's, ne uh, what's the next business venture aside from your commercial real estate? You know, um, in Japanese, um, beer is biru. Mm -hmm. In Japanese, buildings are biru. So I do two things in my life, biru and biru, <laughs> and keep life simple. <laughs> Keep life simple, and so I, I my goal is to to make uh, Aloha Beer the number one beer in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. We're gonna uh, we've already opened uh, overseas markets. Mm -hmm. um, you will see Aloha Beer everywhere you go, and I really think we make a very good product. You and do. so while I'm doing that, while I'm my goal is to um, travel the world and promote two things: promote Hawaii and promote Aloha Beer. You're a great ambassador for the state, but now um, since we're towards the end of the program, I have to ask you this. Uh, you moved to Hawaii from Guam, um, and I guess other people will call people like that transplant, but you have um, grow deep roots here. Uh, you are a leader in a lot of the community civic professional organizations, and I know when I first approached you for this interview, uh, you share with me this particular picture, and producer, if I can ask you to um, show the second picture with uh, Steve and Emperor Akihito. And um, oh, yes. Steve, maybe you can tell us about this very prestigious position that you right. are in right now with the Prince Akihito Scholarship Foundation. Right. I, I'm one of the trustees mm -hmm. of the uh, Crown Prince Akihito Foundation, and our mission is to raise money and um, uh, provide scholarship for uh, students, mm -hmm. graduate students who want to study in Japan and graduate students from Japan who want to study here. So it's a very, very worthwhile um, uh, mission. And that picture was taken at the time when the emperor visited Hawaii uh, on his 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, that's an amazing picture, believe me. It, it wasn't uh, photoshopped or anything, that's an actual picture of myself mm -hmm. um, uh, shaking hands with him mm -hmm. and uh, that was uh, that's one of my very special pictures that, mm -hmm. I, that I, I, I keep in myself but um, um, 
I showed that to my friends. In fact, I showed it to my mom, and she, that came, to this day, she probably doesn't believe that I actually shook hands with the emperor. She then asked you whether you photoshopped it, did she? That's, well, she doesn't know the word photoshop, <laughs> but she couldn't believe what she was looking, so uh, oh, wow. that's what that is. Uh -huh, yeah. uh -huh. So how long have you been uh, a trustee then? I've been a trustee mm -hmm. uh, since 2010, mm -hmm. right, not long, and uh, um, it, it's, it, it's clearly one of my uh, most uh, um, uh, high priority mission mm -hmm. is to continue to help bridge Japan and the United States, continue to bridge uh, Japan and Hawaii, and doing it through education. You are also involved in a lot of other organizations, the Okinawan Chamber of Commerce, the Filipino Chamber of Commerce. Tell us about all those and where do you find time to, um, to help all these different organizations? Well, you know, it's my heritage, right? I, I come from the Filipino heritage, uh, the Japanese heritage, Okinawan heritage, mm -hmm. so it's uh, important that I uh, stay rooted in my heritage. And of course, Hawaii, you know, you, you've got all that. and. Uh, um, I, I just want to help. That, that's all I want to do. And, and I enjoy. I just enjoy being with people. I enjoy helping people. And uh, as I said earlier, you know, our business is really not real estate. It's all about how we can solve problems. And, and the world is full of problems, as you know. We live in a very problematic world. Mm -hmm. But if we just stay rooted with, with, with our visions and, and uh, um, pray a lot, I think the world would be a lot better place today. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, Steve, I wish you all the best because I'm sure that you will have some other amazing transactions and stories to share with us. I hope to have you back sometime down the road. Um, all the best and wonderful to have you today. Thank you very much and uh, aloha. Aloha. My guest is Steve Sombrero. He is the president and principal owner of Cheney Brook. You've been watching Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Thank you for joining us. Stay tuned for our show next week. Aloha.